in our last meeting before Hanukkah, we discussed the concept of a rodef. And we started with the premise that a rodef is involved in a Meiser Redifa. And as such, you're allowed to kill him if need be. If you don't have to kill him, which is called Yochel Atzilo Varov, then he's not really a rodef. Because a rodef means it's either his life or the life of the person that he's pursuing to kill. And since you could have both survive, then there's no din of rodef. But we came up to the conclusion that there are many scenarios in which it's quite possible that the Rodef maintains his status as a Rodef even if he's not involved in a Meiser Adifa. And that's what we want to pick up today. So first of all, let's mention that in the contemporary Chuvas, with regard to neutralizing terrorists, we have a number of breakthrough chuvas of great significance. And they all seem to be based on the fact that you could kill a terrorist as a rodef, even if he's not involved in a Meisr Adif. And we have to understand why, but we had already uh, precedent. Like, for example, if you remember, we discussed on the bottom of page four, a tshuva from Rav Moshe Feinstein Igus Moshe, and he speaks about the fact that um, the Nirdaf himself could kill the Rodev, even if, had he made a more serious decision, he could have shot for the legs, if you remember that discussion. And also keep in mind the case of Habava Machteres, where we apply the principle of Habola Hargacha Hashkem Lahargo. And we see that burglar who breaks into your house and digs a tunnel in, he is already considered a Rodef even before the Meiser Adifa. It's only that you have a right to protect your possessions and in doing so to confront and encounter the burglar. And therefore, Hashkem Lahargo, but he, he's not yet involved in a Meiser Adifa. So, as I said before, we'll take a look at these two. So the first one is from Rav Yaakov Ariel. You may have heard of him. He has the yeshiva uh, outside Tel Aviv in Ramat Gan. And uh, he's also a big rabbi in Ramat Gan, chief rabbi, and his brother has the Machon Yushalayim. If you've heard of it, Machon Migdash. Machon Migdash outside the Kotel. Anyway, so Rav Yaakov Ariel wrote a, a tshuva sefer called Ohola Shel Torah. And this work is exclusively dedicated to tshuvas, many, many tshuvas about Medinat Yisrael, anything related to the state of Israel. And one of the uh, tshuvas that we want to study tonight is directly related to the question of killing a terrorist. And he writes the following. Again, we're not going to read the whole long tshuva inside. I'll just sort of... Um, pick and choose what I think are the highlights of the tshuva. And he says the following, that Dine Milchama, with regard to a battle, a war, those dinim noagim klolam acherim me'asher b'chayim azrachim, the laws that govern civil life in general with regard to one citizen or another, are not the same laws and regulations that govern milchama. The milchama gam im harodef if sick et ridaf ridifato vinisog. So at this particular moment in time, the rodef is not involved in a meiser ridifa. Nisog means 
He's running backwards. He's a fugitive. Mutar lemutkafim lirdofach rav ulahargo. We will chase him down and we will kill him. Now keep in mind, at this point in the tshuva, Rav Yaakov is not addressing the case of a terrorist per se. He's talking about Mulchav in general. And if we're in a battlefield and our enemies decide to run away, we will chase them down and kill them. And the jump is going to be here, a kind of a leap of faith, that attacking terrorists would also be in the framework of milchama. Now, again, as we're going to see this develop in front of our eyes, we have to differentiate between the milchama that we're involved in now, which is very unique, because it's a milchama against the terrorists, as opposed to a regular milchama or for that matter, a regular terrorist attack. So for example, if a terrorist uh, was involved in a, an act of terror and now he's running away and we're running after him, we're not sure that in that case, Rav Yaakov is going to allow us to track him down and kill him. Because that's not within the framework of Mulchama. But if on the other hand, talking about what's going on today, the milchama is against the terrorists. These are our enemies. And we are fighting a battle against them. And as we said before, in the context of milchama, the rules change. It's no longer, well, is he involved in a Mysore Adifa? And then we can kill him? No. He's Nisogachar. He's running away. But we're going to chase him down. It's an expansion of the law of Rodev within the framework of Mulchama. Now you might ask, what gives us the right to expand the law of Rode? But we've seen over and over again, and that was our last uh, discussion, how we expand the law of Rode. And we're now categorizing another example of expanding the law of Rode in the case of Mulchama. And therefore, even though the Rode is Nisog Liachar, Nevertheless, as is the rule with regard to any mitzvah mulchama, we will run after him even though he is a fugitive. He is what we call in Hebrew boreach. He's running away. And if you take a look at the pasuk in Shmos, in the Shira Sayam, Erdof Oyev Asigem. I'm running after the Oyev until I catch up with him. The Enam Chayovim Lavi'u Ledin, the entire Chiddush, the thrust of the breakthrough, the revolution of the law of Rodef is that we can circumvent the legal system. We don't have to bring him to justice to a court of law. In a sense, it's a kind of Kim Levi Ramine. We take the law into our own hands. From now on, we're going to run after these guys and we're going to kill them and we're not going to bother locking them up and bringing them to jail. And honestly, again, I, I shouldn't say this maybe, but I'm going to tell you what I feel in the heart of my heart. You remember those uh, scenes that they showed us with the, uh, you know, with the Hamasniks, you know, half naked, you know, taking them off in the truck when they, when they surrendered. You, you shake your head if you remember that, that scene. And I'm not sure they should have publicized that. But anyway, uh, that wasn't my decision. But I was thinking to myself, why do that? Why give them a chance to surrender and then they'll be exchanged in the next hostage exchange and they'll be at, back to kill us like the thousand terrorists who we traded for Gilad Shalit. You have a golden opportunity here within the framework of Mulchama to kill the terrorists. So you might say, maybe they're not terrorists, they are I don't know what, maybe they didn't have enough time to get the Air Force there, or maybe they wanted to get information and intelligence. I, I don't know exactly what the shikul was as to why they I waited for the... What? Go ahead, Moshe. I think if they surrendered in the context of, a, of, of battle, then to um, not, not to accept their surrender would be a war crime. 
No, no, no. I'm not saying, Moshe, not to accept the surrender. Don't misunderstand me. What I meant to say, but apparently I wasn't clear, and I apologize for that, is that we should be one ahead of them before they surrender, when the Melchama is still going on. At that point, we have every legal and halachic right to, to blow them off the face of the earth. Who wants the green? Okay. Fill up. Do you know what happens? We fill up at our, our cells here. We feed them three times a day. They get educated. I don't know what other monies we spend on them. And then in the very next trade-off, they're out there to kill us again. Do you follow what I'm saying? I thought it was a golden opportunity that was missed. Obviously, I don't know enough. You know, I'm just a regular guy here, a spectator on the side. But in the context of what we're studying here from Rav Yaakov Ariel, that in Milchama, even if they're running away, we can kill them. Why wait till they surrender? That, that just, I'm saying, you know, food for thought, that's all. V'kachu noeg b'chol milchamos ba'ola, v'gam Yisrael, etc., etc. So again, if there's a personal altercation between two citizens, and maybe one citizen could be threatening another citizen and pursuing him to kill him, in that context, if he's no longer involved in a Meiser Adifa, he's, he's given up, he ran, start running away, you can't kill him. That's not a Meiser Adifa. But in Melchama, the Dinim are absolutely different. And he says the following, Ella Shavu Melchama, you see that paragraph? I'm going to sort of read between the lines, if you'll allow me to do so, and explain what bothers Rav Ariel at this point. He's addressing a problem which he doesn't even spell out. What is that problem? At some point, if we apply these Dini Melchama that allow us to run after the enemy and pursue and kill him, even though he's not actively threatening our lives, we may risk the possibility of anarchy. What do I mean by anarchy? Could you imagine if the Din of Rodev applies to an enemy in the context of war who's running away from us, well, Rodev means that the Nirdaf, or anyone else who's trying to save the, the Nirdaf, takes the law into his own hands. In other words, are you opening up, from a halachic perspective, a, pan <coughs> excuse me, a Pandora's box, that every single Chayal could start running after every single Nirdaf without recouping and reorganizing. Where is the discipline of the army? The military requires a discipline. It's not called Dich Vin If every individual Chayal is going to decide, well, he's running away from me, I'm going to go run after him until I finally kill him. Where is the commander who has mandated you to go ahead and run after him. We're in the middle of a mulchama. There's got to be a discipline. No, but is it a heter to kill or a chil? It sounds like it's a heter to kill. So it's not a chil. It's not a chil on every soldier. That if they're in a situation, then you have a right. you have a heter to do so. Not... No, but I think what the what Rav, Rav Yaakov Ariel wants to tell us here, and that's the next paragraph, I'm just giving my introduction in Lefiani is Daiti, is that it's not going to be FKRs. I'll tell you why. It's not that every chayal will... It could be there is a chiyub to run after the, the enemy and kill him. I don't doubt that. But upon whom is that chiyub incumbent? Is it you? Is it you? Is it me? It's on the tzibu. And he claims that the mitzvah of Melchama is incumbent on the tzibu. And once it's a chiv on the tzibur, then it's the tzibur that will decide exactly what our course of action will be. It's not going to be an individual yachid. Each chayal will decide for himself how he's going to fulfill and participate in this mitzvah of erdof, etc. I will run after my enemy. And who represents the tzibur in a mulchama? It's 
the generals of the army, they will commission or mandate you as to whether or not you should be running after the the Oyev who's Nisog Ocha, or in our case today, running after the Mechabim. Otherwise, I think it's anarchy. Take a look in the next paragraph. Ella Dafka Mishumshi no Seit Ofi Tsiburi. Do you see that? Chayavim Litnahel Al Yidei Hamalchut. Who represents the Tsibur? It's called the Malchus. And who has the authority of Malchus? It's not young Yankel Beryl and Shmerel, they'll decide for themselves. But rather, there's a there's a framework, there's a miscarriage of the Tzibur and a Malchus of the Tzibur. And therefore, if you see the next paragraph, Ulam, he says that, you know what? In certain situations, it could be a commander will decide, let's run after these mechablim. And that doesn't undermine the framework of the cloud. Because the commanders will decide, how do we maximize Hatzola? He asks the following question, almost like a naive question. Mina tant kudalia el arogat sisra. Did Yael decide with her own initiative to kill Sisra? Or did she get a command from on high? Should we say that she is a murderer for killing Sisra or the opposite? Moshas es Yisrael. And the Pesach says, So he quotes Rav Cook, the first chief rabbi of Palestine in Mishpat Kohen. She took the law into her own hands. She had doubts about whether she could have a, you know, an escapade with, with Cicero. She had relations with him over and over again until she finally killed him. But she never had a doubt that she would kill him. But nevertheless, and here, I want you to take a look at number Vav. You see, he has eight principles that summarize this tshuva. If you look at the sixth, he writes, "B'matzav milchama, yesh la teit bidei hamitgonem merchav pula gadol yoter ulatir lo harigat atokev gam achrei brichato kidei limnoa mimenu mechavera v'efsharut l'tkifa no sefer." So do you see those words, merchav pu'ula gadol yoter, those four words. If I could ask you to underline them, but again, you don't print it out, but Moshe, I think you printed it out. So maybe you could underline those four words. Because I think this is the breakthrough <coughs> of Rav Yaakov Ariel. And he is arguing that in the case of a Melchama, when, let's say, a certain battalion a certain right, we call it a pluga, is involved in a in a face-to-face -face confrontation with the enemy. We're going to allow for a merchav gadol yoter. We're going to allow for a certain expanded allowance to rely on the chayalim yes. to decide that if we don't take the law into our own hands and kill these oivim, or mechablim in our context, then they're going to come back and attack us. It's all back and forth, back and forth. That's the ping pong of a battle, of a, of, a, of a war. So how do we balance these two polar extremes? One polar extreme says we can't allow the soldiers to have their own, um, what's the word I'm looking for, their own window of decision, uh, there's a better word than, uh, because it's going to be anarchy. The other polar extreme says, no, we we're in a molchama. You know, we can't let these opportunities slip between our hands. Otherwise, they're going to come back and attack us. So there's a certain leniency that leaves 
the chayalim a margin of freedom that breaks through the restricted bounds of the tzavah. And if you take a look at Hey, the one before Vav, he says, What happens if we run after this terrorist and we kill him? Let's say that a chayal took the law into his own hands, made a shikul, made a decision, and weighed the pros and cons that we have to go after this guy and kill him, and he did so. Then in one case, the chayal will be taken for judgment. In another case, he's a free man. We should applaud his action. If on the one hand, he deliberately, out of a sense of, let me kill this guy. And here, Rabosai, we get back to something that we discussed weeks ago. In the case of Avner, do you remember that Avner kills Amsa? And you remember that the Gemara says he deliberately killed him with the with the sword. He put him in the you know in the in the torso, the part of that he killed his he got to his covet and so on, whatever it is. He says in that case, the chayal should be brought to judgment, not as a rotzeach, because again he did it for purposes of self defense. But nevertheless, he violated his, his circumference of rights. But if, on the other hand, he did it totally, we'll call it L'Shem Shemayim, because he understood that if he doesn't take that action, this terrorist is going to come back and, and kill him, or his buddies, then call it Kavon, as we say. Let's applaud his action. So what do we get out of this tshuva of Rav Yaakov Ariel? He says the following. Again, we're looking at number Zion now. We, as individuals, cannot declare war. The war has to be decided and declared by the tzibur. And therefore, each individual soldier within the context of the mitzvah that was declared by the Malchus, by the Tzibur, has to be meshubah to the Tzibur. He's got to get his orders from the Tzibur. And therefore, this is the discipline of the army. No single chayal could violate that discipline. However, the exception to that rule is self-protection, self hatzol. But the important thing is that the system should not break down. There should be a framework. There should be a milchama that's incumbent upon the tzibur and those generals who are running the military operation, they will decide and each chayal will accept those guidelines and those instructions. Now we get to a second shuva and that's a Rav Re'em HaKohen, again a Rosh Hashiva of one of the great Outstanding has the Yeshivot. And he says the following. Adam shenim tzab besikun mi mechabel. And W asked me, do I kill the mechabel? And am I obligated to do so? He says, chova lashmido. In other words, if the mechabel is now actively pursuing you, you have a mitzvah to destroy him. And that's the mitzvah of killing a rogue. However, we said before that if you can save yourself or someone else who's being pursued by a Rodef without killing the Rodef, then that's not called a Maiser Adifa. Maiser Adifa is only either or. Says Rarei Makohen that with regard to Mechabel, Lo Kayam Din Latzilo Be'echen Eivara. A Mechabel has set up every single Jew as a Nirda. He is pursuing every last Jew. And therefore, he has the same status as a Baba Machteres. 
And above him, Akhteris, we say we can kill him even before he's involved in a Meiser Adifa. And therefore, the law of Yochel Hatzil Omeyechem Nevarv doesn't apply. Like we saw in Rabbi Shev Feinstein, it doesn't apply vis-a-vis the Nirdaf. And we're all Nirdafin. I'm telling you, Rabosa, when I saw this, I jumped out of my skin. You're telling me that with regard to killing a Mechabel, I should not be inhibited by the law of Yochel Atzil Bechamevara. Go for it and destroy him. And that's my view. But he goes ahead and he says that Kasher Mechabel Menutral. If we have already neutralized this Mechabel, we haven't killed him, but now he's neutral. He cannot endanger anyone's lives. He says in such a case, Once again, coming back to that same point, that Rav Ariel had made in the earlier tshuva, in the later tshuva, he says again, a chayal is straightjacketed, if you will. He is restricted to the laws of mishmat, of listening to the malchus and their horah, and that he can't violate. And that's a halachic principle. So what do we get about what do we get out of the second truth? What do we take away? You know, you always talk about takeaway. The takeaway here of the Ra'ema Kohen is that with regard to a machabel, there's no din of Yachalatzilo Bech Mevar. We shoot to kill. However, not in the case of a machabel who's minutral and he's no longer endangering our lives. And that's going to lead us to the tshuva of Rav Shlomo Aviner on the bottom of page 5 going on to page 6. Now I am talking to you from Malaya Dumim. I used to travel from Yushalayim daily to Malaya Dumim in a taxi together with Rav Shlomo Aviner. And he has become in the Hezder Yeshiva world and beyond like holy Posek, like, you know, the Posek Hador, so to speak. He's a Frenchman, by the way, you know. If you know any French, speak to him in French. Did you teach with, with Elisha? His brother's Elisha, no? I don't know. That I can't tell you. I think his brother was in my dad's I thought so. Oh, yeah? Could be. Yeah, probably. <laughs> now, in this particular tshuva, what should fascinate us, fascinate us in understanding the background of this tshuva is who wrote the shale. Every tshuva has a shoel. And this shoel was a man by the name of R.L. Azaria. Again, I emphasize Azaria with an aleph, not with an ayin. Anyway, he, as you know, killed a terrorist who was already neutralized. But he writes a, a she'ela to Rav Aviner in which he presents his understanding of the reality, meaning why did he kill the terrorist? So Rav Aviner is going to respond to him on that level, meaning we're not issuing a uh, a final judgment. He was condemned as, you know, as the courts condemned him. I'm not sure if he's still in jail to this day. I think he's out already. But anyway, but Rav Aviner is going to relate to the question the way it was formulated, as every Meshiv is. You know, the Meshiv is not going to question the description of the facts as described by the Shoah. And in this long question, the Shoel claims that just a few minutes before he killed this Mechabel, 
the Mechabel was disarmed of a, of a, um, I say remote in English, a, um, a hand grenade. But he was not aware of that. That's number one. Number two, he describes the events in his life leading up to that final event. And that's on page six, if you want to see it. He says that this was a period of time in which there were many, many terrorist attacks. Many Jews were killed during that period of a month. And he describes as he participates in the funerals of a number of people, friends of his, who were killed by terrorists. And this was all part of the Intifada. He says that I and my wife suffered tremendously during the Intifada. And not only that, this particular terrorist, which he killed, was had already um, implemented a um, a knifing, what's called a dekira. I was told about the dekira. I don't think that the nidkar died, but it came close to dying. Anyway, and I was told that they found a hand grenade in his possession. However, they did not tell me that they had disarmed this terrorist of his remote. I came close to him. He was tied up. And I saw a sudden jerk. So even though he was tied up, he was able to jerk his body. And because of the, he calls it Sarata Rigashotshali, I was in such a state of tension. And I knew in my not mind, the reality was not so, but in my mind, he had a hand grenade. I understood that the reason he jerked his body was to try to blow himself up with the Ramon, with that hand grenade. And therefore, I shot him. And just minutes later, they determined that he was dead. He says, this was my presentation to the courts. However, the prosecutor never accepted my story. And there were witnesses who, who answered the question of the prosecutor in the court, was, were the lives of the other soldiers in danger at that time? So he said no. And therefore, they decided that this was a cold-blooded act. And he finishes up by saying that I contradict, I deny all of that. So he asks the following question, what is the halacha in this reality? Uh, does the halacha see this as a retzach bedam kar, as a cold-blooded murder, well calculated? Or does halacha see this a as killing a terrorist who was already involved in a terrorist act, and in the mind of his killer, so to speak, he was holding on and threatening to blow himself up. Two. If I made a wrong decision because I was in such an emotional upheaval, does the halacha take that into consideration? That maybe my mistake was a result of not only that I thought there was a danger to our lives, but also because of my emotional state of being. And in a footnote, I would write the following. In France, there's something called the crime of passion. Are you familiar with that? I mean, I'm not going to go into detail, but the classic case in the French courts was a man who discovered his wife with another whatever. And he killed the man on the spot. Or maybe he killed his wife. I don't remember exactly. I think he killed the man. 
So in France, that is a mitigating factor. It's called the crime of passion. Does the halacha see it as such as well? Tshuva. Do you see the word tshuva? It's underlined on the right. It's about 20 lines down from the top of page 6. Because this I want to read inside with you. So Rav Hainer writes, Vare shasur menatora la rog goy. We don't allow killing a goy. But zemidu bar begoy chaf mi pesha. We're talking about an innocent goy. Avla bola hargacha hashkem la hargam. We have the rights to defend ourselves. The yesh mitzvah la'ayu gisarobi. In order to save the new in yesh tzorach l'kach. If it's necessary in order to save the nirda. On them, however, kasha rodev kashur. If the rodev is tied down, the ain bef shaguto la rog, he can't possibly kill you. He's basically, um, what's the word I need? Um, neutralized. Neutralized. Okay, I was just, I'm looking for another word, but anyway. So he doesn't Polarized. have the capacity. What, what's yeah. the word? Incapacitated. Oh. I, I didn't catch. Okay. He says, if he's kashur ve'en bef sheruto rog, he can't kill you. Vada'i osu lahog. Ach. Kol ze nemar berodev Hapoel the Orechad Pami. We're not talking about terrorists. There was a tremendous enmity, an altercation of, of most profound between Reuben and Shimon. Reuben is running after Shimon, and he, he's going to kill Shimon. Ach Adam Shehuchzak Lirdov. I'm going to add my own little flavor here to Huchzak Lirdov. His very essence, his very proclamation of his goal in life. Is to kill Jews. shall rodef tmidi, a brand new definition of rodef. There's such a thing as an ongoing status as a rodef. He's always a rodef because his essential agenda is to kill Jews. So even though right now at this moment he's not endangering anyone's life. Kill him as a Rodef. What do you mean? Why is he a Rodef? Where's the Maisa Redifa? The answer is he's a Rodef Tmidi. There's such a thing as a Rodef who self-declared himself as a killer of Jews. That's all he's interested in. That's his goal in life. That's his agenda. And he's a Rodef Tmidi. V'yesh lahargo. K'day lahatziel mimavis es korbanot habayim. Now he's not endangering, anyone, endangering anyone's life. But he will endanger someone's life. We are now going to kill him as a rodent because tomorrow he is going to endanger our lives. I'll be honest with you. When I read this, am I allowed to say this? I said to myself, with all due respect to Rav Avinair. Who gives you the audacity to create a new category in Allah of a Rodev Tmidi? Can you tell me where I could find this concept and what Sugin Shas of a Rodev Tmidi? Where is it? But then I quieted down a little bit. In the next line. Because... Yeah, but again, a Baba Machteris is not a Rodev Tmidi. When he goes out of the Machteres, you can't kill him. And not only that, if he's neutralized, you can't kill him. He's talking about a person who's a Rodev Tmidi. Find him, chase him down, kill him wherever he is. Find him on the moon and kill him. He's a Rodev Tmidi. Kill him because he will endanger Jewish lives in the future. I would tell... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you did you? Yeah. 